Okay, so here's where we left off last time talking about Darwin and descent with modification. So during the time of Darwin, when he was coming up with all his theories of the Galapagos Islands, obviously anytime you are doing anything in life, you have this idea, but it takes time for that idea to take effect. Uh, if you're writing something, it takes a while to obviously write it, then get it published, everything like that. But Regardless of whatever your goal is, it takes a while for it to come to fruition. So during uh, this time when Darwin had pretty much all his notes done, there was another person named Alfred uh, Russell Wallace, and he received something from Darwin that pretty much said uh, the same thing as Darwin's descent with modification. His theory was natural selection. So Darwin then was like shaking his boots, like, oh my goodness, I, I got to hurry up here. So he finished his book, got it published, uh, and he was pretty much like, you know, the first one done with everything. So that's kind of why Darwin gets a lot of the credit. Plus, Darwin had probably a little more data to back it up. But here's a picture uh, of Alfred Russell Wallace. Okay, so in Darwin's book, he explained three things, unity of life, diversity of life, and the match between organisms and their environment. And we'll go through each of these in the next section. We already talked about this. Darwin never used the word evolution uh, in his book, The Origin of Species. He always said descent with modification, just because the word evolution, like I said, Darwin was not the first person to mention evolution. Since other people were mentioning it, they felt it went against religion, against the church, against a creator. So Darwin did not want to use that word because he, he would automatically get a negative connotation put on his book. That's why he said descent with modification instead. All right. So what Darwin did is he, and we talked about this last time, guys, he used the what species that were living and then the species that were found in fossils and even you know further down in the strata to fill in all the gaps to relate the ones that were still living compared to the ones that were way, way, way extinct. All right. Here was the first picture of one of Darwin's trees that he uh, made. And if you look at the top, it says, I think. So he thought this was going to be the whole process on how things may be started in one area and then that species went to uh, not turn into but modify into different species that were better adapted for that environment. So let me show you guys a tree, whether you call it a dichotomous key, um, a cladogram, whatever. All right. So here is a tree of uh, different elephants. So down here, the bottom, we could see the Asian elephant, we could see the African elephants. Up here, you could see we got manatees, right? So we're thinking that manatees are related to elephants. And if we go back far enough, guys, we could literally say everything is related to everyone if we started with, you know, bacteria and things like that. But in this one, we start off here, and this area is going to be our oldest members. So right here, these are going to be our oldest ones. And then this branched off and gave rise to different organisms. Now, these organisms here, these are extinct. In order for these organisms, the ones over here, all of these guys, to become around in present day, ones have to go extinct. All right. Now the opposite of this, we got the Asian elephant, African elephant. We got extant. All right. So if they're extant, they are still around today. If they are extinct, they're no longer here. Okay. So you can see we have two different types of African elephants. We have one type of Asian elephant here, and you can see the difference between the ears 
They're also a little bit of a different color. African elephants have more of a like dark gray color. Uh, Asian elephants, they're more of a lighter gray, uh, even slightly brown, and they have like some pink in them. Uh, their ears are a lot smaller too, okay? But anyway, so that's kind of how you read a tree. Remember guys, the ones all the way on this side are gonna be the most recent ones coming out, right? Coming into the world. Um, and the ones on this side, probably extinct, okay? Okay, so next thing we're gonna go over is something called artificial selection. So this is where we as humans kind of screw up evolution a little bit. Why? Because things look um, pretty. So Darwin noted that humans have modified, not us, but different species by selecting which ones are gonna breed and which ones aren't. So let me give you an example of this. Some people really like bulldogs. Other people don't, all right? Some people really like beagles. Other people don't. So I'm using dogs as an example. Some people really like labs. Some people don't, you know. But let's say that everyone in the world, every single person, decides that dash hounds, little wiener dogs, are the cutest dog in the world. What we can do is we can say, okay, everyone wants a dash hound. Everyone wants these little wiener dogs. Everyone wants them. So what we're gonna do is we are gonna make them breed more often. This does not mean that a dash hound is the best dog in the world. It does not mean whatever their characteristics are. Uh, it does not mean that those are the most favorable for a dog to survive. But we as humans are choosing that, hey, we need more dash hounds. We need them to reproduce. So we just keep letting the dash hounds reproduce and reproduce and reproduce. Pretty much we lock a male and a female in a room and yeah, you, you get it. Hope they get the job done. That is artificial selection. We are choosing which traits are gonna get passed on and which do not, all right? So we are literally deciding which organisms are gonna breed and which ones are not gonna breed. So Darwin drew two inferences um, from different observations. Our first observation, members of a population vary based on whatever traits they get. Here we go. Here is a variation. We got a bunch of different ladybugs here and you guys can see that some of them have more spots, some of them have less spots. Now, with this observation, some of them, and in this example, I, I like to think the ones with less spots blend in better to that particular branch that they're on, but ones with less spots might be hidden a little bit more, so they might not get eaten right away. But the ones with more spots, they kind of stand out a little bit more. His second observation, all species can produce more offspring than the environment can support, and many of these offsprings fail to survive and reproduce. What this means is that we produce more offspring than the environment can support. So let's say hypothetically we, and I'm just making an example here, we colonize Mars. We send a thousand people up there. Problem is maybe we only send enough food up for 500. Uh-oh, right? Not enough food to support all the people on, you know, when we colonize Mars. So what's going to happen is the 500 that are best adapted to get that food, probably the strongest ones, are going to live, and the other ones are not going to get the food, meaning they will um, die. Here is a plant that has a spore cloud coming out. In this spore cloud, there are so many spores that could possibly get in the ground um, and grow. But most of them are not. Most of them are not going to get enough water, maybe not enough nutrients. They're just not going to be adapted to survive. So most of them are going to die. But maybe 10, maybe 12 of them are going to live. All right. So way, way, way more are getting produced than are actually going to survive. So here was his two inferences based on his observations. We kind of already talked about these. 
Individuals whose inherited traits give them a higher probability of surviving and reproducing in a given environment tend to leave more offspring than other individuals. So let me just talk about the first part of that. Go back to the Mars example. Um, we are going to have 1,000 people on there, only food for 500. The strongest ones are going to probably be able to survive. If they survive, they're going to reproduce all right, they're going to leave more population. When we talk about natural selection, all right, the best uh, adapted individuals tend to leave the most offspring. Now, not to bring up dominant recessive things there, but if we're talking about dominant uh, genes, whatever ones are dominant, whatever ones are favorable for that community, and they might be recessive, who knows, you know, but whatever ones are the most favorable, they are going to be the ones that reproduce more often. Now, please don't think about humans with this because humans just screw up everything, you know. You go back to the 70s and a girl, if she's attracted to a guy, you know, it's going to be, if you watch any shows from the 70s, it's going to be the guy with the fullest mustache that you could find and the chest hair just, just flowing out, you know, because that was attractive back then, all right? The media said, oh, this is, this is attractive, okay? But now, all right, lots of big mustaches tend to uh, maybe not be as favorable, okay? Women, like, don't like that as much anymore. But you guys can see how humans are influenced. It's not based on uh, survival, it's based on just, hey, what looks cool? What doesn't look cool? You know, it's a little bit different. But in the lion community, in the cheetah community, it's going to be like the fastest, the strongest lions. These are things that can actually be looked at um, rather than just, you know, hey, he looks good or she looks good, you know. Okay, inference number two, unequal ability of individuals to survive and reproduce will lead to the accumulation of favorable traits in the population over generations. This is descent with modifications. Let me give you an example of this, guys. Let's say, hypothetically, uh, people were born with, I don't know, like one leg, and this really wouldn't happen, but people were born with one leg. Some people were born with two legs. The people with two legs are going to reproduce more often than the people born with one leg because they can... They're, they're a little more mobile. What's going to happen is those people with the two legs are going to reproduce, 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 where the ones with one leg are not. Over time, just like that short neck giraffe example we went over last time, over time, the one-legged legged people are going to disappear from the population, and we're only going to be left with people who have two legs. Now, does this happen quick? No, it's generations upon generations upon generations that this needs to continue to occur for that one-legged trait to leave the population. So Darwin was also influenced by another scientist called uh, Thomas Malthus. All right. So what he noted was potential for human populations to increase faster than food supplies and other resources. What this means is that we have too many humans with the resources given. So I did that Mars example with you. So those that have these favorable um, adaptations, they're going to survive, they're going to reproduce, and those traits are going to go on to the next generation. Now, the last bullet point here, again, do not think of humans for this. But any other organism, they're going to reproduce based on what traits are favorable. How do we determine what traits are favorable? Well, if they're really good for that environment, they're going to be favorable. Uh, if a monkey is born with one arm, that is definitely not a favorable trait because monkeys are in the trees all day. They're swinging, they're jumping, you know. Um, one arm is not going to be a good thing to have. All right, so we already talked about the first one. Um, individuals with certain, whatever they are, favorable traits uh, are going to survive and reproduce more often than other individuals. Reproduction is the main thing, guys. The more an 
individual can reproduce, the more fit they are. Humans, again, not a good example because we do not, we choose to have kids. Uh, we do not like, you know, hey, I'm going to have 38 kids. There's just no way you could do that, all right? And the kids be, I guess, like successful, all right? There's no way we can do that. But in the animal kingdom, they just keep mating and mating and mating and having more babies. So here are uh, two different insects, if you guys can see them, all right? So there's one there blending into that environment. Here's one here blending into the flower environment. So they're going to be pretty much all like the same type of bug, just with different adaptations. Switch them up in their environment, and those adaptations are horrible. We don't want the brown bug to be on the pink flower because he's easily seen and he's going to be eaten. Not good, right? Okay, so going back to Lamarck, Lamarck thought that individuals can evolve. They can change things. That's not how it is. Populations evolve. And as I said, it takes generations upon generations for this uh, can happen. If the environment changes, the adaptations that are favorable are also going to change. So it's not just one thing that's going to influence the other. All right. Next section, guys, we're going to go over um, some different adaptations and things like that. All right, I'm going to post a video for you on uh, antibiotic resistance. So that's what this thing, the, the video is on. But for this, let's talk about drug resistant bacteria. So we're always making new antibiotics for bacterial infections, things like that. Now, as the bacteria dies from whatever kind of antibiotics we are taking, the ones that are affected by that antibiotic are going to die. Some of them might not die. Some of them might have a mutation that gives them resistance to the antibiotic. If you remember uh, earlier in the year when we went over how to like plate things, I went over like antibiotic resistant bacteria like Ampicillin um, is an antibiotic we can use to kill bacteria, but if some of them are resistant, they can still grow on the ampicillin. But anyway, so for this bacteria, if we have a bacteria that is not resistant to the drug, it's going to die. If we do have one that's resistant, it's going to live. Now, the antibiotics are made so that it should kill that bacteria. So most of them, whatever, 99.999% of the bacteria are going to die. Maybe one of them might live. And what's going to happen is that one is going to reproduce and reproduce and reproduce. And bacteria reproduce very quickly. They, if you remember, they use binary fission, and it's a much faster process than ours because they can do transcription, translation, all, all that kind of stuff. They do everything at the same time. Um, and their reproduction also is very, very quick. Uh, they don't have a nucleus, all right? They just have one chromosome that is circular. Everything's very quick for them. So over time, this mutation can become the new norm, and it can build up and build up, all right, and become more common. Now we have this drug that doesn't work on the bacteria anymore, so we've got to create a new drug. And that's how bacterial resistance happens, and this is why drug companies always have to make um, new drugs. Okay, so let's stop here for the day, guys. Um, we'll continue on with the rest of it next time. Should be able to, to finish the chapter next time. All right, so keep working on your reading, guys, and have a good rest of your day.